Pretty good. So good afternoon and thanks for joining us today. And again, thanks for your patience as you uh, listen through these briefs. Next slide, please. This afternoon, I will be providing a brief overview of the Department of the Navy FY15 budget submission. Uh, this submission continues to be grounded in the strategic foundation highlighted here. Uh, it builds on the quadrennial defense review, which builds on the defense strategic guidance, as was talked about earlier today. So we use those documents and those strategies uh, in concert with the secretaries, the chief of naval operations, and the commandant's priorities to guide the hard choices that we're going to be talking about today. I think it's important to note that consistent across the full scope of all that strategic guidance you see up there, the presence, capability, and readiness of the Navy and Marine Corps team has never been more essential to the strategy. Next slide. This is the Navy and Marine Corps today. Shown here is the output of decisions made to balance requirements and resources in prior years and the current year's budget. These are the investments that generated the presidents, the capability, and the readiness uh, that you see today. So very briefly, around the world, we have 42,000 sailors and almost 5,000 Marines underway, deployed on over 100 ships, two carrier strike groups, two amphibious readiness groups with the associated Marine Expeditionary Units. There's an additional 30,000 sailors and 35,000 Marines forward around the world, including 6,000 Marines currently serving in Afghanistan and 25,000 Marines in the Pacific Area of Responsibility. Consistent with the QDR and the DSG, you'll see that there's 49 ships in the Pacific and 32 ships assigned and deployed to the Middle East. So these are the forces that over the past year gave the President options spanning combat credible forces that influenced the options for diplomacy in Iran and Syria to the immediate response to the Typhoon um, Haiyan and Philippines by the GW strike group, as well as by Marine C-130s and V-22s. This is a Navy and Marine Corps mandate here to be where it matters, when it matters. Next slide. This is the funding input in constant year dollars that resources the Navy and Marine Corps going forward. So as you can see from the FY10 peak to the end of this fit up, FY19, in real terms, the resources are down by over a fifth. And that's with the additional funding that Undersecretary Hale discussed earlier today above the sequestered BCA levels. If continued to the BCA levels, as shown here out to 2023, the department's resources would be down by about a quarter. Even if you assumed a notional level of OCO out in FY19, uh, the reduction would still be in FY19 from the PB plus a notional OCO about 19 to 20 percent. So this is the very challenging fiscal environment uh, in, at the same time that we're dealing with a dynamic and still very dangerous security environment that uh, the department uh, dealt with. The programmatic priorities shown here were applied to achieve a balanced force aligned to a consistent strategic foundation that we talked about. Next slide. Bringing that display now into then your dollars is shown here. And if you do the first build, please. So what this is showing in the gray boxes is, is the reduction from the PB14 level uh, that this is in this year's submission. You'll see that it's $38 billion less for the Department of the Navy over the fit-up, and $15 billion of that is in the first year. Balancing that reduction is what uh, required hard choices, it required some innovative solutions and approaches, and it required strong stewardship initiatives that we'll be talking about in the upcoming slides. Next build. If the department were returned to the sequestered levels of funding, which is shown approximately by that red arrow, that would be an additional fit of production for the, for the Department of the Navy of $39 billion. As testified by the service chiefs in November, the department would not be able to execute all of the, depart the defense strategic guide missions at that level. We estimate those reductions to accommodate that level of funding would require inactivation of a carrier, decommissioning of an air wing, decreasing the size of the Marine Corps to 175,000, removing six surface combatants from service, and eliminating the planned fit of procurements of three DDGs, a submarine, and four TATFXs. Those reductions would also further impact the readiness accounts, uh, decreasing presence and surge capacity. Next slide. So in the next few slides, we'll briefly cover each appropriation in detail, and I'll highlight the major changes from the PB14 submission. This slide serves to provide an overview of how all the appropriations balance and I'll talk a little bit about how they changed in uh, proportion of the budget from uh, the prior year enacted level. So starting with the MILPERS, which is in the lower left in red, uh, this appropriation is 31 percent of the uh, FY15 request. It's up from 30 percent in FY14 and 29 percent in FY13. Uh, it reflects the top line coming down while end strength essentially has been re remaining flat. The operations and maintenance account in blue funds the elements needed to operate the force. 
This account was 29% last year in the FY14 omnibus enacted level, which was a decrease from 32% the year before, reflecting the additional OCO funding that Congress applied in uh, the omnibus appropriation. In the PB15 submission, this level returns to the 32% of the base budget. The procurement account in green uh, has declined from 28% in FY13 and 26% in FY14 to 25% in this submission, reflecting the fiscally driven reductions in procurement, uh, particularly in aircraft and weapons procurement. Research and development has grown slightly from 10% the last two years to 11%, and that reflects the priority given to developing key capabilities for the future. And finally, new infrastructure investment as a share of the budget declines from 2% to 1%, reflecting the overall fiscal pressure on the Navy and Marine Corps accounts. Next slide. In MILPERS, you see two services on slightly different paths, the same as last year. The Navy is ending a decade of plan planned end strength reductions and stabilizing the force to improve manning at sea, to improve seashore uh, rotation, and to increase cyber capabilities. The FY15 budget specifically targets improved fit and fill metrics, and fit is the percent of sailors assigned to a billet with the required skill code, the NEC classification. Fill is the percent of authorized billets filled. This budget targets fit and fill metrics of 92% and 95% respectively, an improvement from last year's target of 90% and 90%. The Marines continue to downsize, and so you see an FY15 base funded level here of 182.7. That includes the first 600 of an eventual 1,000 increase in the Marine Corps Embassy Security Guards. The Marine Corps also has OCO-funded temporary end strength expected to end in FY16. As Undersecretary Hale discussed earlier today, the decreased manning levels that you see in these slides outside the budget year, i.e. in FY16 through 19, in both the Navy and Marine Corps cases largely reflect planning levels pending the decisions to be made in the FY16 budget submission regarding Marine Corps steady state and strength and the retention of 11 aircraft carriers and 10 uh, carrier air wings. It's important to note that no personnel changes will be made until there's a final decision, in particular on the carrier and the air wings. Under Secretary Hale also discussed today the compensation and benefit uh, changes proposed in the budget for the Navy and the Marine Corps. The savings from slowing the rate of growth of military pay and benefits are being invested to improve the quality of service of sailor and Marines. These investments include uh, training enhancements, such as improved training ranges and simulation capabilities to include small arms training, as well as increased travel funding for training, investments in spare parts, and enhancements in surface ship maintenance. More broadly, this budget also funds increases in career sea pay and career sea pay premium that recognize and reward uh, sailors and Marines that are spending time at sea. It funds a high deployment allowance that compensates for the rigors of extended deployments, and it restores critical skills bonuses to retain our most highly skilled sailors. Next slide. In the civilian personnel accounting, you'll see a slight increase in FY15 and a steady decrease across the full fit up. Navy FY15 increase of about 1,500 full-time equivalents reflects a continued priority on getting ship maintenance right, with additional mandates for overhauls and availabilities at our regional maintenance centers. It also reflects increases to critical programs such as sexual assault prevention response and cyber. U.S. Marine Corps growth of 800 uh, full-time equivalents is consistent with the level that is being executed in FY14 and also reflects, again, increases for specific items such as increased cyber capability and the increases in the Marine Corps Embassy Security Guards. These increases are partially offset uh, by headquarters reductions that start in FY15 and reduce headquarters personnel over the fit-up by 20 percent, as well as some other reductions that were taken based on affordability. Overall, these levels reflect the essential contributions of our civilian personnel throughout the force, both in Washington, D.C., and more broadly. Over 90 percent of our civilian personnel are contributing to the force outside of D.C., training our people, fixing our gear, and managing our infrastructure. Next slide. The department's readiness counts are tightly focused on the op tempo that our combatant commanders are requesting, properly sustaining our ships and aircraft to reach their expected service lives, and properly training our people. The FY15 base budget metrics are funded to the historic levels uh, you see here. As Undersecretary Hale indicated earlier today, uh, the department anticipates submitting an FY15 OCO request later this year that includes readiness funding that improves these metrics. 
a very briefly uh, overview as with the FY14 request, this budget funds ship ops to 45 days underway uh, per quarter when deployed, 20 days underway when non-deployed, flight hours to the historic standard metrics of two, T2.5 and T2.0 for Navy and Marine Corps respectively, ship and aviation depot maintenance 80% the base, Marine Corps ground equipment at the same level as last year with much of the remaining OCO reset of the equipment, and facility sustainment funding, which decreases from FY14 to 70% in FY15 for the Navy and 75% for the Marine Corps. Uh, in FY16 and out, however, the sustainment funding improved to 83% and 90% respectively for the Navy and Marine Corps. Next slide. The SECNAV's goal is to achieve stability in shipbuilding, uh, to affordably meet our warfighting requirements. And uh, you will see that this budget has prioritized shipbuilding to meet that goal. This program buys 44 ships in the FITUP compared to 41 in the FITUP last year, 14 to 18, and 43 in the 15 to 19 columns of last year's shipbuilding plan. Two destroyers and two submarines are purchased every year across the FITUP. There was one less LCS purchased in FY15 than last year, three versus four, reflecting that $15 billion top line reduction I talked about uh, at the beginning. We bought what we could afford. In accordance with Secretary Hagel's LCS decision, the LCS program continues as shown through FY18 to a total of 32 ships, buying 12 in the fit-up. The two units shown here in FY19 reflect the prior program. As directed, the Navy will provide small surface combatant proposals in next year's budget, as well as regular updates of LCS testing and deployment experience. Other changes from PB14 include the addition of one afloat forward staging base in FY17 that uh, delivers in FY20, sliding LXR one year, uh, with advanced procurement now in FY19 and full funding in FY20 due to fiscal constraints. Also due to a top line reduction, PB15 aligns delivery of Kennedy CVN79 from the latter part of FY22 to FY23. In the RCOH line, refueling complex overhaul, as Secretary of Defense Hagel also announced, the department will make a final determination on refueling the George Washington in the FY16 budget submission. Pending that decision, this budget funds planning for the defueling required. Overall, in FY15, eight ships are delivered and 13 are retired, bringing the FY15 battle force count to 283. Going forward, the battle force grows to 309 ships by 2019 with this plan. Finally, as Secretary of Defense Hagel also mentioned, given pressing resource constraints, the PB15 submission proposes to place in a special status, special category, and induct into phase maintenance uh, 11 cruisers, starting in FY15. This approach is driven by affordability but it provides substantial cost savings while modernizing the ships to the latest capability and extending their service lives. A similar program has also been proposed for three LSDs on a rolling basis, modernizing one at a time. Next slide. In the aircraft procurement appropriation, overall reductions of 111 aircraft and $9 billion are taken from PB14 level, reflecting the fiscal pressure, the resource pressure we talked about. FY15 reductions include four F-35 Charlie carrier variant uh, JSF aircraft, 10 E-2Ds, and 10 P-8s. The initial operational capability IOC dates for the F-35 Charlie and E-2D remain unchanged with these profile changes in 2019 and 2014 respectively, and the P-8 has already achieved its IOC. In the Super Hornet and Growler line, those fleets are transitioning from production to sustainment. Key Super Hornet modification programs are funded in this budget to include the new infrared search and track uh, pods. In the UAV section, the U-Class, the Unmanned Carrier Launch Surveillance and Strike System, remains on a path to achieve early operational capability by 2020 with a contract award projected for FY15. And finally, the Triton MQ-4 has been rephased as shown in this profile to account for a delay in development. Of note, the FY15 Opportunity Growth and Security Initiative that Under Secretary Hale talked about has a designed focus on readiness and modernization and the Department of the Navy request for that includes eight P-8s and one E-2D, among other aircraft required. Next slide. <clears throat> In weapons procurement, FIDIP investment was reduced by $2.8 billion from the PV-14 level, reflecting a combination of resource pressure and inventories reaching requirements. FY-15 is the last year of the tactical Tomahawk procurement as that program transitions to sustainment with a recertification depot line and modifications that are going to keep that weapon as a premier attack weapon 
over the course of its service life while we develop the next uh, generation uh, land attack weapon. In other lines, I'll highlight uh, consistent with QDR guidance to rebalance for a broad spectrum of conflict. This budget funds key capabilities such as restart of the Mark 48 heavyweight torpedo line with procurement starting in FY16 and procurement of the long range anti service uh, uh, missile, the Lorasm, starting in FY17. In aircraft weapons, we take a one year pause in AMRAM while operational testing completes and then ramp up production. Next slide. In Marine Corps procurement, the base budget funding decreases by $275 million from the FY14 level, reflecting the fiscal constraints. A few major efforts I'll highlight in 15 include improvements to the light armored vehicle uh, with uh, funding to modernize the legacy turret and the tow missile system. Uh, there's funding to begin procurement of the Humvee sustainment modification kits, uh, development and testing of the joint light tactical vehicle, which is a, the newer vehicle provides improved performance and protection compared to the current Humvee fleet. FY funding supports production of seven LRIP uh, vehicles. And the budget also supports the procurement of additional low rate initial production uh, ground air task oriented radars, uh, radars, which is an expeditionary radar uh, designed to detect rockets, missiles, and artillery. Next slide. In the R&D account, science and technology funding declines 2 percent in FY15 and then remains steady over the balance of the fit-up. A few major systems I'll highlight. F-35 Charlie funding fully funds the system development and demonstration to maintain the Stovall IOC in 2015 and the carrier variant IOC in 2019. CH-53K is rephased due to affordability to a path that puts it on uh, track for a milestone Charlie in the third quarter of FY16. The Executive Helo starts uh, system development and demonstration this year with Milestone C SCAD in FY19. In shipbuilding, the Navy's top programmatic priority, the Ohio Replacement Program, continues on track uh, for lead ship construction starting in FY21. In the Amphibious Combat Vehicle Program, the Marine Corps has refined its strategy and restructured the program to provide a phased incremental approach. This budget will fund the manufacture and testing of the first increments prototype vehicles as well as continued tech development for later increments. On the slide, you'll see the electromagnetic railgun highlighted. Uh, this gun is a key future capability that's under development, uh, and it's funded for uh, an at-sea demonstration aboard a joint high-speed vessel in 2016. Finally, an important element of the stewardship initiatives that I highlighted at the beginning, beyond the 20 percent management headquarters we already talked about, is a $3 billion per year initiative to reduce the cost of business across our acquisition enterprise, spanning R&D, O&M, and procurement accounts. This includes actions to reduce contracted services, and partly that's being done through requirement review boards, also known as contract courts, to reduce cost growth with increased competition, consolidation of multiple service contracts, use of uh, should cost management, as well as eliminating lower priority and lower return on investment tasks. Next slide. The Navy and Marine Corps have pressurized FY15 MILCON, supporting the Department's most pressing needs with 41 construction projects. FY15 MILCON supports the introduction of new weapon systems with projects such as uh, the Ohio Replacement Program, Power and Propulsion Facility in Philadelphia, and Air Wing Training Facility in Fallon, Nevada that supports JSF. MILCON also supports priorities such as nuclear weapon security, uh, completing the last year of the Explosive Handling Wharf in Washington. Enhancing global posture with a wing and support squadron facility in Guam and quality of life with a BEQ in Yorktown, Virginia. In family housing, the Navy requests support to operation lease, lease and maintenance of 10,000 units worldwide and the Marine Corps requests uh, 1,300 units worldwide. No new public-private ventures were funded in family housing construction. The $16 million shown funds revitalization of uh, 44 units at Marine Corps Air Station Iwakuni. Next slide. As Undersecretary Hale discussed today, uh, the President's budget proposes an opportunity growth and security initiative focused on readiness, modernization, and improving uh, facilities. The Department of the Navy's share of this uh, initiative is $9 billion and features items such as those shown here. Next slide. So overall, I'll, I'll wrap it up uh, here. Uh, the, the real takeaway is in this period of fiscal austerity, uh, the Department has put together a budget at a time of continued very high COCOM demand uh, for naval forces that balances investment in presence, in capability, and in readiness, 
It's laser focused on ensuring force wholeness and sustaining our war fighting edge in alignment with the strategy that we started the brief with. Subject to your questions. Yes. Question on the decision, Megan Scully with CQ. Um, the decision on the cruisers, how much exactly will that save? And is that the first step towards decreasing the size of the cruiser, ultimately decreasing the size of the cruiser fleet? All right, so we estimate that uh, that approach will save about $4 billion over the fit up. Uh, and it is not the first step to decreasing the cruisers. There is uh, an acknowledged enduring need, worldwide need, for the cruisers. Uh, these are the Air Defense Commander uh, Corps vessels um, that uh, are required to uh, uh, sail with our, our carrier strike groups. So the department is absolutely committed to uh, modernizing these ships over the long term. It's a very well thought out plan. And as I acknowledged in the brief, it's driven by affordability concerns. Uh, but we think this is an innovative way to keep these ships in the force, to modernize them to the most current capability, uh, and to s sustain their lives. Hi, John Harper with Stars and Stripes. Um, can you uh, break out the Marine Corps part of the budget and the Navy part of the budget in terms of the top line, uh, excluding OCO, and kind of compare this year's request to the FY14? request and the enacted. Right, so we'll, we'll get the numbers here, but I mean, yeah, overall, uh, just from 14 enacted to the 15, the Department of the Navy request goes from 149.8 to 148. So even in then-year dollars, let alone real ter real terms, the, the, the top line is decreasing. And uh, Mary, you know, that probably that actually is a question better for us to take. Uh, we, uh, we'll just give you those figures uh, at the appropriation level of that split. Yes, ma'am. With Reuters. Um, can you say a couple of words about the CH-53K rephasing? And then also, I just want to ask you about the, if you could help me understand the, um, o, the OSG fund or initiative a little okay. bit better. Sure. So like, you know, you go from 16 P8s and 14 to 8 and 15 in the base budget, and then you get 8 in the OSG. All right. But just, just you know. All right. So uh, the, the CH-53K obviously is um, the Marine Corps heavy lift aircraft. It is absolutely uh, uh, an imperative for their mission. Uh, and as a former Expeditionary Strike Group Commander in 5th Fleet, uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, you, the uh, amphibious readiness groups and the Marine Expeditionary units I had had the full scope of the new aircraft, the new uh, Yankees and Zulus, uh, had the V-22s, and we absolutely relied on the 453s, uh, typically employing them on the LPD. So um, very important capability. Uh, fiscal reality is a hard thing. And so as we balanced, again, uh, made some hard choices, the 53K was uh, seen as one where we could uh, slide that a year based on the existing inventory and still get to where we needed to go with recapitalizing that part of the, the Marine Expeditionary Unit. Um, so you also, when will that IFB occur then? I'm sorry? I mean, when, when will that program, like, so it just gets delayed by one year? Or? Right, exactly right. The um, Opportunity Growth and Security Initiative, uh, Under Secretary Hale talked a little bit, so um, uh, you know, I'll defer to, a little, uh, to some extent to the OSD talking points on it. But essentially, it is a, it's not part of the budget submission. It's an administration-wide uh, initiative uh, that's broader than DOD. There's uh, a domestic uh, government piece of it as well. Um, and it is um, is designed, again, to focus on some fairly specific things, uh, on readiness, on modernization. So you will see, for example, uh, no, no force structure uh, across these uh, requests uh, and improving facilities. So in the Department of Navy one, it's, again, it's one year only. It's FY15. Um, there are investments spanning the things that are highlighted on the slide, but to include sustainment uh, funding that brings the department uh, from the 70 and 75 percent, respectively, almost to full sustainment funding. To your question on P8, so um, there are eight in the base budget based on, again, the, the choices that were made and how to balance those elements of presence, capability, and, and readiness uh, um, that were made. Um, and because it was fiscally uh, driven the, the, and it was, you know, modernization, the, the balance of that eight were requested in the OGSI fund. Tony. Capacity with Bloomberg News. Can you try the, uh, the George Washington decision again to clarify it? This budget basically just funds a 10 carrier force contingent on potentially refueling decisions next year for the George Washington. Is that accurate? Right. So um, starting in FY15, this budget fully funds uh, the GW and its air wing. So the GW 
uh, in FY15, in the budget year. It fully funds. The GW is in Japan, obviously. It returns to Norfolk in the latter part of FY15, actually in December of 15, so that would be FY16. So it's fully funded for operations and it fully funds it to return here. So in FY15, the budget year, there's no issue. So what Secretary of, uh, Under Secretary Hale was referring to, in FY16 and out, in next year's budget, a decision will be made based on the factors he talked about, about whether to refuel that ship or to um, not refuel it and inactivate it, based on the, the discussion he talked about uh, in terms of the conversation with the Congress. If they decide, if you're forced to refuel the ship and keep it in, in the inventory, is that about a six to seven billion dollar increase over the fit of the Navy has to find? Correct. Aircraft question. I was matching the fit of last year with this year on the Joint Strike Fighter, the C model. All right. Last year you were asking for 69. Now you're asking for 36. So you've knocked out 33. Correct. Reason being? Well, affordability. Not performance. Nope. Not tail hook yeah. issues. Right? So I mean, the, we're working through those issues, and we see a steady uh, path forward on those. But this was a fiscally driven uh, decision, uh, and what's important is it still gets it to IOC. So the, what the requirement is to have the 3F software have this aircraft IOC and FY19, we're still on a path for that. But in terms of the affordability, uh, that's the decision was made here. Thanks, Go ahead. Like the Aviation Week, um, you mentioned in the budget documents just kind of passing reference to improving programs for Super Hornets and things like that for the mods and everything. Give me an idea of how much that's going to be, at least in fiscal 15. For the specific mod line for F-18? Right. Uh, and, and we'll, we will get you that data. Burgess Seafar Magazine. Secretary Hagel used the term reduced operating status for the 11 cruisers. Uh, will they be kept in commission with reduced crews, or how, how is that going to work out? Right. So they're going to be in a special status um, with reduced crews, and that analysis is still being done right now. Um, and I think um, I can talk to at a high level of that, but uh, we'll also have additional detail on exactly how that works. Um, but those uh, 11 cruisers will start their phase moderniz modernization in FY15. Uh, they'll go into the special status, uh, they'll go with reduced crews, and then they were going to start going into the combat systems mods and phased availabilities, uh, likely starting in the FY17 time frame. Yeah. Sir, uh, I'm a pressure health from Sea Power. Uh, OCO, there's a tentative OCO uh, package in, in the uh, DOD budget. All right. You have an idea what the Navy Part of that would be, and would most of that go for the core, or you know, what? All right. what maybe yeah, no. a version of vocal. All right, thanks. Um, so, as Under Secretary Hale described that, he said it's a placeholder. Uh, it's a placeholder level of 79 billion. And the reason he said again is because we don't know what the enduring presence in uh, Afghanistan will be, which would inform so much of that analysis. I will say, for the Navy's case, a lot of what we have funded in OCO in terms of ship maintenance and steaming days is going to be in in continuing for a number of um, years after, uh, you know, OEF uh, essentially ends or we get to the steady state. And that's because of what has been talked about, I think, in, in other forums. Uh, as the department has surged uh, surface ships and deferred maintenance, that's all maintenance and work that uh, needs to essentially be re recovered over time. All the services have said, uh, you know, upon completion of major combat ops or whatever that the determined endpoint for OCO is that for a, mo a number of years, we're going to have to reset the force and use OCO. So to answer your question more specifically, um, we have not done uh, the specific analysis on, uh, across the, the Marine Corps and the Navy on what the elements, other than more broadly what I talked about in some of the readiness accounts, uh, where we, again, will bring those up to 100 percent in, in the uh, readiness funding. You haven't done any elements, uh, any concept of how much of that 75 bill DON with the Department of the Navy would get? Past, past All right. So I'm, I'm going to decline to speculate on what uh, that percentage might be. Again, as we decide what, as a nation, as, a, as a the president makes a decision on what the enduring presence is in Afghanistan, that will inform uh, Marine Corps rotations, it will inform the uh, naval support of that. And another point that is sometimes subtle in the OCO accounts is even as ground forces come out of Afghanistan and out of that region, as long as there's a requirement for overwatch and what remains, that drives naval presence. That drives our aircraft carriers, that drives our operations to be available to support even a smaller footprint there. Well, you mentioned uh, maintenance for the ships, but the Marine Corps has a big reset uh, for its ground equipment. Absolutely. Uh, is that you envision you envision that going on after OEF? Absolutely. 
Yes, ma'am. Hi, Megan Eckstein with Defense Daily. Um, so for FY15, you have no unmanned aerial vehicles, and across the FIDIP, you have no MQ-8s. Um, I was wondering what the reasons for that what was and kind of what that does to the overall capability for the veteran. Right. So the department's very committed to uh, unmanned air systems, and so I talked about U-Class in particular, uh, and, and UCAS being a demonstration that continues on in FY15 as well. In MQ-8, due to affordability, the department made a decision to phase the MQ-8 uh, procurements to the LCS, and there was, in prior years, a specific notion of procuring uh, MQ-8 specifically dedicated to SOF, um, and uh, that is a decision now that uh, the department will handle through the global forest management allocation process, which is to say we have an MQ-8 on an LCS and a combatant command commander needs uh, support for a specific SOF operation. Um, that that's the way we'll handle that. Um, so that's that's what's going on in that line. Yes, sir. This is, uh, John Emery I'm from Flight Global. Could you quickly recap the CH-53K? I didn't quite catch what the decrease in funding was or what the change was. Right, right. So we essentially slipped it a year or rephased it a year. Uh, so if you look at the profile uh, in aircraft procurement, um, and I should actually say that's in the R&D line, uh, yeah, so you have to go to the R&D slide uh, and show that we, we phased it. And so essentially what we did is now milestone C is scheduled for the third quarter of FY16. Yes, ma'am. Todd Seck from Marine Corps Times. I'm wondering uh, what elements of the Marine Corps Pacific Rebalancing Strategy are funded uh, in this year's budget request, and uh, if that strategy has been amended at all. As seen in the request. Maybe you could be a little more specific for me. Um, uh, between UDP to uh, deployments to Australia uh, to resettling on. on right, so at the levels that we're talking about, the Marine Corps uh, has continued to execute that plan. There's been no, you know, uh, large deviation away from that. And, and, and in particular, as you talked about, with the rotational deployments to Australia. Um, uh, and what 3MEF does in terms of, uh, you know, the Pacific presence, uh, really no changes to that. Uh, in terms of anything you would see in the budget, uh, in terms of their funding for operations, in terms of their funding for their end strength levels, again, at 182.7 uh, in this budget, um, you know, that's, that's on a solid vector. Just a I already asked you. So, any, yes, sir. Yeah, hi, uh, Sam McGrone with the Naval Institute. Uh, just to follow up on Megan's question, does that mean that the Navy isn't going to pursue the C model of the Fire Scout for the MQ-8 line? Ed, do you have any uh, insight on? No, I'll have to get that for you. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I'll get that for you. And then are you all budgeting in for the, the change orders, taking the DDG-51s to the Flight 3 variant, and when, when's that coming in? So the Flight 3 DDG is scheduled to be the second ship purchased in the FY16. Uh, and then from that point forward, uh, we procure Flight 3 DDGs. Okay. Is there a change order built into the budget? Because that's, that's a, a lot of work to upgrade you know, the 2A model to be able to handle the AMDR. It's that funding profile that is supported that I just described in the budget. In the corner? Um, yes, Sarah Handel's Kyoto News. Um, in the QDR, it says that by 2020, 60% of Navy assets will be stationed in the Pacific, including enhancements to presence in Japan. I was wondering if you could elaborate on what that enhanced presence in Japan will be. So let me speak to the, the broader topic first. Um, uh, and then the specifics of what might change in Japan, I think we'll have to give some, some data. But the rebounds of the Pacific was absolutely a focus, not only the QDR, but this budget. Um, so starting with the presence, uh, as you talked about, by 2020, we'll have 60 percent of our battle force inventory assigned to the Pacific. Um, in terms of actual presence, in, in the slide we showed today, the Navy today, you saw about 49, 50 ships in terms of deployments there. We expect by 2020 that would be up around 65. In terms of the rebalance uh, with the capability, so you see the Navy preferentially uh, sending the most advanced uh, and the most capable platforms and payloads to the Pacific. So the F-35C, the E-2D, the P-8, the Triton, AMRAAM missile. Uh, and in terms of the ships, uh, you see the Zumwalt, the Flight 3 DDGs, the fourth SSN uh, going to Guam in FY-15. Uh, we've got the rotational Marine Forces in Australia, uh, as well as the ongoing work with 3MEF there. So um, you see a very strong focus overall and support in this budget for that shift to the Pacific. 
And so we'll get you some data on specifically any sort of changes within Japan. Yes, ma'am. Um, in the Opportunity Growth and Security Initiative slide, um, you have Future Force, Key Modernization, and it lists a few aircraft programs. F-35 is not listed. Does that mean even if you all did have the funding, you would not increase the numbers across the fit up on that buy since you co cut so many? Right. Right. All right. So that's not in the cards. Right. right. It's not, yeah, exactly. It's not part okay. of that funding. Well, why is that if it was an affordability decision and not? a capability decision. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would really have to say we'd have to you know, look at more broadly what's in that, that initiative. Um, uh, so, um, uh, yeah, so I would have to get back to you on that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, the Marine Corps Embassy Augmentation Program, uh, there have been some question about where those bodies would come from, whether it would be an additional, you know, additional force structure added on to the Marine Corps, or whether they were just going to have to find it out of their existing size. Uh, the slide that said 182.7 uh, implied that they would get some extra people, um, but not the full thousand that I believe Congress is going to require. Right. So the 182.7 is the FY15 number, which reflects the 600 additional that are, are being brought in FY15 as we ramp up to the higher number. So they're likely to have, if sequestrations held off somewhere in the neighborhood of 183 at the end of the day? So I think the um, non-sequestered number that the Secretary has alluded to is 182. 182.1 is the Marine Corps number. What's the 182.7 then? That's the FY15 level. So in terms of a steady state level, what is being talked about is 182.1. The, the uh, yeah. follow-up, the, um, the 600 additional, maybe 900 additional for an um, MSC for right, the right. action. 900? So um, we'll get you a specific number. It's either high 900 or 1,000. It's, it's in that time, in that okay. area. Do you have a cost estimate for that? I, um, I'm sure we, we will give you a, we'll get you a specific dollar figure for that end strength. And the, overall, the overall Marine Corps budget, does 22 billion sound like, is that, is that the, the number we're talking about? And that's about 1.8 billion down from last year? So I think that's part of the earlier question. And do you have that data, Mary? 22.8 billion. 22.8 billion. Yeah. And we're in time for one more question, please. OK, yes, ma'am. I was wondering if um, you could highlight a little bit of the, um, the LCS mission modules. What, what is FY15 funding? And what's the outlook now that the, there's one ship that's been pushed to the right? Right, right. So that's a great question. I think I'm going to ask Lee, ask, uh, say what? Okay. To give you that level of detail on specifically what the, the testing is and how they're proj projecting, we'll uh, we'll get that to you, sir. Um, you mentioned the uh, next generation line attack missile that will come after the Tomahawk. Um, has there has been any actual work done on that or budgeting for that program? So. Okay, so an R and D line starting uh, in FY15. Um, again, so that's kind of managing that transition from from the Tomahawk going to sustainment and to the initial R and D on that. Uh, the Tomahawk's going to be a viable weapon in well into the the late 20s. Uh, so uh, that's that's kind of how that phase is being done. Alrighty, appreciate it. Thanks for your uh, time today.